lot of family and friends that did not know the Lord. And I was saved in a time, like I said, that the Holy Spirit just moved across this part of the United States. And I, I don't make any defense of it. I, I just fell in love with Jesus, and all I thought about was Jesus 24-7. I fell, I fell in love with him. I went to Bible study. If I didn't have it in my church, I went somewhere. I, I just stayed in the Bible. My wife and I, wherever we went, we just shared our faith. Now, the problem was, was I was a new Christian, and I want to see my family saved so much. I want them to experience the joy that I had, the cleansing that I had. And so, I, I, you know, I came in like gangbusters. And, and they came from a very, very uh, orthodox uh, uh, Catholic which I did too. I was in priesthood. You know my testimony. Uh, background. And when I came home and I said to them, you know, you really need Jesus in your life. They looked at me like I was in some cult. And then I said, I said I'm not talking about going to church on Sunday. I'm talking about having Jesus 24-7. Now, let me tell you how my life so touched my father in a way that, like I said, I didn't have to preach. He used to do my tax statement every year. My first year I got saved, I gave him all my receipts. And he said to me, he called me up, he said, what are you, nuts? How much did you give to charity? What happened? I said, that's called tithe, Dad. What do you mean tithe? And then I tried to explain it to him. Well, I went to, that touched him more than all the witnessing I ever did was just the tax statement that I gave him every year. The point I'm trying to bring out is that little by little, some people, friends, fell away because they didn't want this life of Jesus. They want to be where? In the dark places. And, and you know, again, you know, <laughs> uh, bad company has the tendency to corrupt unless we're strong in the Lord. What's going to happen is either they're going to be influenced by our lives or they're going to fall off from our lives because good and evil cannot reside together. Belial, the Bible says, and God cannot, two cannot walk together unless they be in agreement. And so you're going to find out after you start to share your faith and live your faith in front of some friends, you may lose some of those friends along the way. But how I many know you have a friend that's thicker, closer than a brother? Better to please him than please those around you and be compromised. And, and so what I'm saying is, and I say this as nice as I know how, I, I don't want people to make the mistakes I made in my early beginnings. I don't want you to tell people turn or burn, heaven or hell. Not that I did it that way, but, you know, sometimes Christians can get a little bit, you know, not just lose tactfulness. That's the word I'm trying to say. We need to ask God for wisdom. We need to be tactful. We need to be prayerful. And we meet, need to be full of his compassion. But here's the most important thing. If we start to practice these beatitudes, our life will be speaking as loud as the message we bring to others. And that's the most important thing, that our life becomes a light to those around us. Because once they see that our life is changed by the power of God, Believe me, the message is the easy part. It's the life that's the difficult part. And so I, I want to pray for you today that, that your life will be so wonderfully changed by God as you surrender and yield yourself to him, that people are going to see that. And, and, I, and I have to tell you this, you know, and my wife will tell you also, uh, in, the, in the beginning, there were people we didn't even know. We were in a social event or a conversation, and they said, oh, you happen to be one of those. Now, we didn't even tell them what we were yet. But they knew. They knew. There's something about the Christian. Some people turn, use the term, this term aura, like, you know, mystical term. No, it's the anointing. It's the presence of God on your life. You know, when Saul saw David walk in the presence and the anointing of God, the Bible says he feared David. I want to tell you something. We don't have to fear the world. How many know the world fears us because we have the favor of God on our life? Amen. So I want you to stand with me today, and the first start for everyone here, in, in case there's someone here that hasn't gotten to this place yet, is, is to make Jesus, listen to me, not just a once a week visitation in the house of the Lord, you have to make him 24-7 Lord of your life. Would you bow your head for one moment? You want, listen, here's what you really want. You want a fulfilling relationship with Jesus. You want to know that he is real. He is working in your life. You see him intervene. You see things uh, that you've never seen before, but you know it's his hand in your life. The only way you're going to understand that is by being 
born again. This term has been so messed up by so many people. But it means to have a real encounter with Jesus Christ. Doesn't care, it matter what you've done, where you've been, and what you're doing right now. You let Jesus first come into your life. Somebody said, well, you know, i got to clean up a few things in my life. No, no, no. You don't clean up anything. You come to Christ looking to Him as the answer for redemption, for salvation. You can't do anything to attain. People think, well, if I, you know, get my life right, if I stop doing drugs, if I don't do this, if I, you know, don't, uh, you know, live in this state of sin. No, no, no. You come to Christ the way you are. And what you admit is this. I am in need of a Savior today. Jesus paid the price on the cross. Secondly, you understand that His blood cleanses you of every sin you've ever committed. But number three is maybe the most important step. You've got to get to the place where you repent. That's where a lot of people never fully engage with Christ. I've seen so many people over the years come to the altar, but they've never gotten to the place where they've completely surrendered. And there's people, I'm sure, even in our church and other churches that come week after week, but they're still not fully surrendered. You have to give your heart completely to the Lord. Repentance means turning in a different direction. Before you were in control, you got to let go of the steering wheel completely now of your life. And you got to say, Lord, here's the steering wheel. Here's the driver's seat. I'm moving over. That's what it means to repent. Once you do that, then God will work on all those things in your life that you're concerned about right now that you're doing that you know aren't right. God will take care of that. He's going to bring you into a place in your life. First place he usually starts is with our language. He'll take care of the language. Don't worry about that. Then he starts working on some bad habits to develop good habits in our life. And then he starts working on some other areas, weak areas of our life. But eventually, like you'll see, you'll see God will take... He's never going to do it all at one shot. He knows that we are people in progress. Remember what Ruth Graham said. Thanks for your patience. How many know we serve a long-suffering God? He's patient. So while your head's bowed, for anyone today, young, old, in between, it doesn't matter. You've been here a lot. You haven't been here at all. But you know today that you want Jesus 24-7 in your life. Would you kindly just put up your hand and put it down and say, Pastor, yes, pray for me today. Yes, God sees those hands, those hands, those hands. Yes, God sees every hand here today that went up. And now I also want to say to the Christian, you know, the Lord really put it on my heart. We're, our, our society is becoming as contaminated as the early Babylon was. That's how contaminated our society is. You know, I look, not that I look, but I see what's going on in these MTVs and these internets. Uh, I mean, uh, can I just be, you know, Brooklyn in a way and say, it's all filth. We live in a filthy society today. Everything today is, is sexual connotation. Every one of these sitcoms, you see these comedy sitcoms, everyone talks about that, that subject. It's like you don't even blush anymore when, when, when you hear about it because you've become so used to it. How many know God wants to do a work in our lives that we can engage and live in this world and not become like it? So I just want to say to you that as I pray this morning, if you're a Christian and you've been like halfway there, three quarters there, but you haven't fully slid over, you don't know what it is to fully immerse yourself in the Spirit of God. Right now, as we pray, I want you to pray the same prayer that these first-time prayers are going to pray. And I want you to really say, Lord, I want you in my life completely. I'm not going to be half in, half out. I'm going to serve you with everything that I have by the help of your grace. So will you pray this prayer, everybody, with me? Just say, Father, thank you today that sometimes your word comes and it brings comfort. But other times... It brings conviction and even correction. Today's word, help me, Lord, to become all that you want me to be. I pray now that you will come into my life and be Lord of everything. Help me in those difficult moments. I call them gray areas. It may be lawful, but it may not be profitable for my soul. Help me, Lord, to make the right decision. 
Strengthen me, oh God. I realize now there are areas of my life that need change. Help me, Lord, to yield to you and to make those decisions, even though they're tough. But it'll make me the person you want me to be. And more importantly, it will put a smile on your face. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life today, for changing me, for making me a new person, and most importantly, never leaving me nor forsaking me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let, let me encourage you, brethren, if you'll just come quickly. Let, 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 me, let me just encourage you as you leave here. And I, and I say this because I love you. The Christian life is a cha-cha. I've said this many times. It's a cha-cha. I'm not into dancing with the stars. That's not my gig. But what I'm saying is, when you understand what a cha-cha is, it's a, it's a front and back movement. There are times you're moving frontwards with God, but there are times you get tripped up. You know, you come short of the glory of God. Here's what I want you to understand. You have to realize that in life, the enemy is going to point at you and say, look, oh, you're a Christian. Look, you made that mistake. You said that. You did that. You didn't do the right thing. Whatever it is. That's what the devil does. He's out to what? Accuse you. He's out to create uh, discouragement in your walk. What you have to realize this. Proverbs, Psalms, and Micah all tell us the same thing. When you miss the mark, get back up again. And say, Lord, forgive me. He says, I'll be a, a light in the midst of your darkness. And go forward with God. Don't stay down. Get back up again. A righteous man will go down seven times. But he's going to go and get back up. What does God look at? God looks at your heart. You ever see that? Uh, uh, the sports kids say, uh, you know, that guy's got heart. Can I tell you? We have to have a heart for God. And what that means is we're not perfect. But how many know we're all works in progress? So I want to encourage you this coming week. The enemy is going to throw everything he possibly can at you. This is what I'm telling you. Because you've heard a message that I believe has the substance of making you the best God wants you to be. By applying his word. And so what's going to happen? He may, you know, uh, before you get out of the gate, have somebody call you and uh, try to distract you or get you to a place you shouldn't be going to. He may uh, do something else to cause you to fight with somebody uh, and say, oh yeah, you're a real peacemaker. Look what you just told that person. Listen, that's what the devil does. But understand, now you're aware of it. You're understanding the battle that goes on between the, the, the spirit of God and the spirit of darkness and the devil. What you have to understand is whose side you're on. You're on God's side. Somebody say that. I'm on God's side. So I may, listen, I may get punched out once in a while. I mean, I took a blind side many years ago. Somebody knocked my tooth out. I'll never forget that. But I want to tell you something. A good fighter gets back up again. And I want to tell you, that's what the Christian life is all about. We may get knocked down, but we get back up. Somebody say amen, and we keep going forward in the Lord. So I want to encourage you today. Don't let anybody tantalize you with those uniforms on, those costumes. When people say, well, where's your costume? You say, I am. I, don't you see it? I'm clothed in Christ today. Pull one on them. Pull one on them. How many of the Bible says, be clothed in Christ? Somebody said, how come you didn't come over with your costume tonight? I am. Don't you see? Well, where is it? Oh, it may be invisible, but I'm clothed in Christ. Somebody say amen today. Put on, your, put on your costume for Jesus today. And go out and celebrate him and glorify him. Put the devil on.